he uh, um, she moved also. Uh, the type of I think that she she was a PA. I think that she worked actually. She worked with one of the dermatologists for a little while. But I said she left. But yeah, John was a great guy. We're quite fortunate, you know, for a clinic our size to have as many and as good neurologists as we do. Actually, yeah, but Eddie's great. Eddie's, Eddie's great good. Guy. The personality. Yeah, right. he's very is accessible. And I told you we have to be visible. You have to be available. You have to. Well, Kitchell told me that fewer and fewer of the neurologists in Des Moines are taking call anymore. They, they try to, but they have had some po politics and they have some Medicare problems. Okay. Yeah. Medicare, Medicaid got after them because they keep sending patients to Iowa City. Yeah, right. So. Yeah, right. So, but uh, like I said, if, uh, if, if there are any uh, residents who are looking for a place to live. Perfect. Well, or maybe I have likeness. Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, the Grand Rounds today. Uh, please remember to sign the attendance record at the back of the auditorium. And also, please remember to fill out and return the program evaluations to give the CME committee any ideas that you might have in regards to future topics or future speakers. Uh, today, it's uh, my pleasure to actually reintroduce Dr. Faraz Shivapur. As you may recall, Dr. Shivapur is a neurologist and an electrophysiologist. Uh, he uh, did his uh, residency in neurology at Henry Ford. Uh, he did his fellowship in electrophysiology at the University of Iowa, where he is currently a clinical professor of neurology. Uh, he's been recognized at the university for his excellence as a teacher. And uh, as you may recall, he gave us a great grand rounds in December on MS. And he kindly has accepted our invitation to come back and update us on headaches. Uh, so please join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Shin. Thank you very much. <laughs> nice to be here again. I look and feel very important with all these devices that I have. You, you can hear me well in the back without any echoes. Okay. So I have to practice with this, I believe. So if we look at the background of the headaches, it has been described, and I tell my patients it has been present from the time of Adam and Eve. Interesting things are the theories. For example, when Hippocrates made the comment, it was correct because there is a migraine variance referred to as orgasmic migraine. Then Plato made the comments about being preoccupied with the body, which is his own way and uh, is a matter of interpretation. But there are questions about, for example, blowing away the frog from the beer. It's like I didn't inhale. I'm sure somehow there has to be some drinking of the beer rather than just keep blowing away the foam. The red wine is notorious because there is a chemical in the skin of red grape which can trigger migraine much more than white wine. And of course, the weather change, barometer change is important. And I like the last statement because in my family, everybody has migraine. And anytime that my kids or <clears throat> my wife got sick and start complaining, I said, there is a God, and I just left the house. <laughs> you talk about migraine initially it was a Greek word referred to as hemicrania. Then Latin used the term as hemigrant and then French accepted that migraine. Eleven to twelve percent of the population of uh, this country have migraine. Just to test to see if these statistics are correct, I just want to see is that 95 percent of men, 91 percent of women have a headache in the past 12 months. By the raise of hand, can you please tell me that if you have headaches in the past 12 months? So it's pretty accurate. And we are not talking about specific headaches. Headaches that you know, is annoying to you and sometimes you have to take to a leave. So 17 billion is primarily loss of productivity because when you're sick, you don't feel good, you cannot go to work, and it goes on and on. Fifth most common, I was surprised with that number, but again, it's the fifth most common reason for emergency room visit. 
The International Headache Society, referred to as charity organization, is too far from being charity. They have very, very great support from pharmaceutical companies. And they came with classification. This is relatively 10, 12 years old, but they have not changed that yet. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about primary headaches, secondary headaches, cranial neuralgia, and they always come with the other headaches. I will like to have enough time at the end for question and answer because so many people have headaches. So some of this slide is just common knowledge and you all are aware of that. So there is migraine, tension, type headache, cluster, and miscellaneous headaches. The, most of the headaches, 50% or so, are above the head and neck. If you look at the number seven, it starts from the ears, eyes, throat, nose, and psychiatric disorder. 40 to 50 percent patients with major depressive disorder or other psychiatric disorder, they have headaches, but they get offended when I tell my patients that, yes, I understand you have migraine, but part of your headaches also could be related to depression. My depression is under control. I'm not going to kill myself. It has nothing to do with it. It is the fact. So that's the reason that antidepressant or SSRI are also commonly used for treatment of headaches and migraine as well. The cranial neuralgia, or the third group, would be optic nerve primarily with multiple sclerosis, trigeminal nerve, you see that usually in the older age group, and then other types of headaches. Central facial pain, when we have no description for that, we call that atypical facial pain, and commonly seen, not commonly, it's seen more often in MS patients. Now again here, 8% of male, 25% of female, when it comes to migraine, and 70% in male, and 80% in female when it comes to tension headaches. Cluster headaches is completely different. Take home message from this slide is, do not make a diagnosis of a migraine in patients older than 50. Unless the patient has had prior history of migraine, but for many years they were fine, they forgot about it. There is no family history of migraine, and they have not had car sickness, motion sickness. It's misleading to make a diagnosis of migraine after age 50, and the worst would be if you start them on triptan. We have had patients that they had heart attack and stroke. Being diagnosed after 50 with migraine, at the same time they had hyperlipidemia, hypertension, uh, high, heart trouble, and they get them triptan and they had a stroke. Now, when we talk about migraine, there are four different stages. There are patients, including my family members, they can predict within 24 hours if they're going to have sick headaches or bad headaches. And some, they can predict if the weather is going to change. So it could be not feeling good within 24 to 48 hours before they get the sick headaches, which is referred to as prodrome. Then you have the migraine aura, which is usually with cephalgia, with pain, sometimes it's without pain, mostly is visual, but could be olfactory and could be auditory. Then you have the face of the headaches, which is usually for hours to up to 72 hours, but I don't see very many patients to go beyond 124 hours or 48, because then we have so many different medications for that. The post trauma is like a battery which is drained. So for 24 hours or so, they're just kind of tired. They cannot concentrate. They don't feel as well. So we have these four stages when it comes to the migraine. For the time that I was in the school, the pathophysiology of migraine was it was vascular. Now I'm going to tell you later that still we are going back to the vascular theory. But the fact is, in the older days, if you would give someone nitro, would complain from severe headaches, because that would cause vasodilatation. Or patients that would have drink two or three, and they had vasodilatation. But if you look at this picture, it makes it very simple. When you're having blood drawn, when they put a needle in your vein, it hurts. And when they take it out, it hurts. Because they damage the nerve, or vasoneurorum, the tiny little I think this should be. So these are the very fine nerves which cover the wall of the blood vessels. When there is a migraine process, vasoconstriction causes the aura, lack of blood supply to any region of the brain. Could be visual aura, could be auditory aura, could be GI aura. 
And then there is a vasodilatation stage, which is the painful stage because the nerve endings are stretched. When the pain, and it's pulsating, because each time that your heart beats, you're going to have this pulsation in the blood vessels. If the pain is very intense, the blood vessels is maximally dilated, then they complain from severe steady head pain. So look at here, there is a trigger. It could be food, could be the weather, could be vasoconstriction, which is the stage of aura, and could be subsequently vasodilatation, which would be a stage of pain. That was a theory in 40s and 50s. Then in 70s and 80s, it was the question of uh, the spreading cortical depression. It starts from the occipital region and it spread all the way up. That's the reason that most of them have visual fortification, they have visual aura, and after that within 15, 20 minutes, they can have severe headaches. Later on, it came brainstem theory. For example, there are nuclei, which are irritated, they send the signal to trigeminal nerve. There is a pathway between trigeminal nerve and the cortical blood vessels. It's called trigeminal vascular arc. Still, we are back to the blood vessels, vasoconstriction and vasodilatation, which contribute to the headaches. Now we are going to talk about CGRP later, which is also back to the vascular theory. hyperexcitability, even in the twins, one, they would be more sensitive, and patients with migraine in the older days in the textbook, they refer to as migraine personality. They are somewhat sensitive, obsessive, compulsive, they want everything to be right, and they, they cannot tolerate any change of a status quo, including the weather change. So that by itself can cause hyperexcitability, as a result of that could be relation with the nucleus rapae or serolius nucleus and brain stem, subsequently trigeminal nerve and then hyperactivity or neurogenic inflammation. The migraine with aura is much more common. In the older days we call that common migraine and classic migraine. We call that migraine with aura now and migraine without aura. So 80% of migraine patients are with aura. This classification is simply for textbook. On the other hand, you know that you know you have the sick headaches, light bothers, your nose bothers, you are tired, you want to be left alone, you can sleep it off, and the best treatment for children, before I forget, is just to sleep anyway. If you can give them one or two tiny rolls and just comfort them and let them sleep, usually the headaches will go away. The migraine with aura, which was called classic migraine, they usually have the visual or could be any other aura, lasts for a few minutes, is followed within 20 minutes, which will be less than an hour, is followed by headaches. Sometimes headaches happen during the aura. And if the aura persists, the headaches is gone, aura persists, there are more chance to have any kind of so-called cerebrovascular event. In other words, ischemic stroke is more common in patients with classic migraine as compared with the common migraine. The hemiplegic migraine is genetics, autosomal dominant, it can happen in children, they have severe headaches, then they become paralyzed in one side, which can last for a few days up to a week. But uh, there are patients that they say, I have a hemiplegic migraine. When you get more and more history, it's not really typical hemiplegic migraine, and you always can do genetic testing to find out is the fact or not. No one wants to listen to that, especially when you give lecture to patients that they have a chronic daily headaches or severe headaches. They say you have to modify your lifestyle. You have to. Life is stressful anyway. Everyone is over busy, over scheduled, and they don't have time to sit and relax for five or ten minutes. But it's easy. You have the handout. If you want to print that, put that in your office and hand it to your patients. I haven't had very many people say, oh, thank you very much. It really helped me. When you come to pharmacological, you have so-called over-the-counters and you have the triptans. What I want to again emphasize, when you come to triptans, you have to be careful. It always reminds me of O.J. Simpson trial because you don't read the manuscript. F. Lee Bailey asked the officer, Did you, how often do you review your manual or manuscript? So we don't do that. How often do you read the small print that it comes in a package? It's very clear, patients, female after 50, male after 40, if they have any risk factor for stroke, don't give them triptan. 
I have 65 years old, 68 years old, that they are taking six or eight Imitrax or Zomic or Maxol a month. They have hyperlipidemia, they have hypertension, they smoke. And we have had patients that they had a stroke. So A, do not diagnose migraine after age 50. B, when you prescribe tryptan, be sure it's not being abused. And those patients have any risk factor? I have patients that they buy tryptans, they pay cash for it. They go to different doctors, they get two different prescriptions. They take 18, 20, up to 30 Imitrax. And this is the Imitrax or any of the tryptan. These are the medications that convert the regular migraine to a chronic migraine. And then we have to give them Botox, which is $5,000. For the severe migraine, there is always change. When my patients go to ER and come back, they got something new. But what you want to be careful if you're an emergency room physician and treat emergency migraine, try not to give them Reglan, because Reglan can cause dystonia. And if it's given frequently, it can cause tardive dyskinesia, which is lifetime complications and a potential for very generous litigation. Triptans, be sure about the age, about the patient's reliability, how many of them they take and do they have any risk factor. Drug that we use or you use all the time is from beta blockers to calcium channel blockers, tricyclic, SSRI, MAOs. We don't use that as often because there is a restrictive diet when it comes to drinking or eating or cheese or other, other food and anti-epileptic drugs. This is something, again, take home message. If you have patients that they have sick headaches or bad headaches or migraine and they're overweight, tryptan is well tolerated. Triptan or Topamax is used for seizure, used for tremor, action tremor, and also used for uh, prophylactic treatment of migraine. For seizure, we can go all the way up to six, seven, eight hundred. For migraine, when you approach to 100 milligrams twice a day, if it doesn't work, most likely above that doesn't work either. Some patients are sensitive to it, they become kind of doped out, so we call that Topamax. They say, I cannot really concentrate or I cannot do my work because I don't think right. That's one of the side effects. Tingling, numbness, paresthesia in hands and feet is another side effect for that. If you have patients with mood disorder, Depakote or Depakane is very well tolerated. You have patients with a sleep disorder, tricyclic antidepressant, gabapentin, and migraine with hypertension, beta blockers, or propar beta blockers, propar is the most effective. The Botox treatment <clears throat> is $5,000. Trinted is given once every three months, it has to be approved by the insurance company. No one really knows the mechanism of action of Botox when it comes to chronic migraine. But by definition, patients should have more than 15 days of headaches. Majority of the headaches should be migraine. It should last more than four so-called hours each event. And uh, it includes injections all around your cervical occipital temporalis and paraspinal muscles. Some have argued that is it really placebo effect or not? No one wants to believe that. On the other hand, when you tell the patient, this is $5,000, I hope it's going to help you, and some patients feel better. But anyway, you give them the medication. If they come back and say it doesn't work in three months, you give another treatment. If they say it doesn't work, you should not give any more. It has become very popular, and many, many even non-neurologists are administering Botox for treatment of headaches or chronic headaches or migraine. This is also very helpful because I always tell my patient it's like a baseball game. You can get struck out. Let's assume when it comes to a female, there is a hormonal change. Then there is change in barometer. We have had weekend that there were 80 degrees, the other weekend was 50 degrees. And then there is some issues, could be at work or home. So you're a good setup to get sick, especially if you end up to have Chinese food or have pepperoni pizza with Mountain Dew. So it's just mostly education. And the many patients, they admit, I give them a headaches diary. They can write down what happened, what was the event. And when it comes to the children, if mom or dad has migraine, 
is very strong gene. The chance of their children, if it's girl, should be 70 to 80 percent. No child, two or three years old, come to you and say that I have headaches. If mom or dad has migraine or both, they have migraine. The child has car sickness, motion sickness, that's the beginning of the migraine. They don't want to go roller coasters. They don't want to go merry-go-round. They don't want to see the backseat of a car or they throw up or they put themselves to sleep. Eventually become migraine later on in life. So I give them the list of food and I ask them to keep, for example, the kid that has car sickness, motion sickness, mom or dad has migraine, don't give them peanut butter sandwich, don't give them hot dog, don't give them pepperoni pizza. If they go to stay with the family, be sure that what they eat not too much chocolate. Because you get a call at 2 o'clock in the morning, they are throwing up, crying all the time, they are not feeling good. Tension type headaches, common. Most people get it. Somehow I have been very fortunate. I have practiced medicine 45 years. Never had a sick headaches or bad headaches. But once in a while, I know it's situational. I get unpleasant, just headaches, and I know what caused that is, again, what am I, the situation is, or what I'm involved with. And I tell myself, no, I believe my patient when they say that, you know, so-and-so comes, or my coworker, or whatever neighbor, I just get these unpleasant headaches, I have to, to I leave for that. So the mechanism of tension type headaches, muscle contraction headaches, some people believe is neurogenic. Neurogenic would be you have a small fibers, C fibers everywhere, more in your face and head and neck, fingertips versus the other part of the body. And the way that I ask my patients to experiment that, I ask them to make a big fist or a strong fist. After a few seconds, your knuckles start hurting because you're pressing the C fibers. But if you're uptight to some degree, not to that extent, within an hour or so, you have this unpleasant band-like pain, like you have a hot hat or you think somebody's squeezing your head. That is referred to as tension type headaches or muscle contraction headaches. Again, lecture to the patient, healthy lifestyle, massage is very good, but insurance doesn't cover that and uh, modify your, whatever you do, try to keep track of it, try to avoid it if possible, but again, talk is cheap and most people don't really pay attention to that. Nutrition, exercise, sleep. <clears throat> Analgesic, and again, the same list that we had for migraine. Botox is not approved for tension type headaches, but if you mix that with migraine, then you can say combination of migraine chronic daily headaches, part of it is migraine, part of it is tension, then the Botox can get approved. This is the worst headache. Some patients in the older days committed suicide. I have had patients that they diagnosed themselves by going online and watching the video and reading about it, and their primary care physician said, I don't think you have cluster headaches. But they had it because it's so unique. 95% plus in men, 98% plus unilateral, sympathetic, parasympathetic involvement, they are so devastated. There is ptosis, there is meiosis, there is lacrimation of the eye, there is drainage of the nose, and they are just incapacitated. Some they have committed suicide in the past. So the diagnosis is important and treatment is very unique. So many medication has been tried for that. Right now, these are the patients that they can write a letter. Patient has cluster headaches. They require to have more than six triptan per given month. And then they approve up to 18 to 20 per month for them. But there are different type of uh, treatment for that as well. This is a patient that he tattooed his uh, headaches on his arm. He's squeezing his arm against his body, so it looks kind of in disproportionate, but it, is, it was in American Academy of Neurology 2015. It's supposed to be one of the worst possible headaches that anyone can have. Episodic or chronic, chronic is the worst, and we have had patients, both categories. So if you want to treat the cluster headaches, it could be oxygen, it could be triptans of any form and the prednisone. 
if you want to order oxygen, you don't give the prescription or oxygen to pharmacy. You have to call medical supply to say this patient is coming. I'm going to write a prescription. Please give them a tank. Please give them the oxygen. And be sure that, you know, they are in a safe environment to some degree. The guy is not smoking and the oxygen tank is next to him. It has happened. It has been happening. It has reported. The short-term treatment versus long-term treatment. Lithium, I have tried that on many patients, has been very effective. Verapamil, to some degree, indocin is usually for hemifacial crania. They have tried occipital nerve injection and occipital nerve rhizotomy. And you can also use lidocaine drip. Put that in the tip of a Q-tip and push it way back to the back of the no nose it can provide temporary relief. This again, patients get very offended when you talk about it. I ask them that, you know, how often do you take pain medication? Oh, I just take ibuprofen. I said, fine, what else? No, only ibuprofen, how often? Two or three times a day or maybe two times a day. When was the last day you didn't take it? I don't remember. So non-prescription medication more than 15 days a month, Prescription medication more than 10 days a month cause rebound headaches. Rebound headaches could be as bad as migraine. But again, it's hard to convince the patients. We bring them to the hospital for three to four days, wash out period, insurance pays for that. 95% of my patients that we did that, within two or three months, they went back and start taking the medication every day. So that's really expensive and ineffective. So these are things that you have to pay attention, especially if you're in a very busy practice and patients come and go and you just want to be careful. For example, patients after 50 diagnosed with migraine, but they really have temporal arthritis. Temporal arthritis is caused blindness. It is a malpractice. So very successful malpractice. They go blind. You cannot do anything about it. So it's nice to have an ESR CRP or jaw colidications or sometimes temporal artery biopsy to have so-called, you, you might refer to it as defensive practice, but at least you have protected yourself and you have protected your patient. Thunderclap headaches, especially in young females. We have had that. They did to a student health, and uh, they said, oh, it could be migraine. They did a medication. They went the day after. Worse, and uh, one patient died. It was venous sinus thrombosis. Back to the history. Papilodema, so it has to be a space occupying. And most of them, if you pay attention, they always say that, hey, you need to have neuroimaging. Somehow you are being told that don't order too many X's or MRI, it's expensive. On the other hand, if you don't, you are exposed. Then new or <clears throat> unusual type of headaches, back to neuroimaging and blood tests. New answer of headaches in patients with cancer or HIV could be infection. Headaches is getting somewhat worse. It could be rebound headaches. Symptoms associated with fever, then you look again for infection underlying focal pathology causing that. Now, this is the new concept in treatment of migraine. We are talking about CGRP. This, you can Google that. This is December 2016. And I have the article here as well. So what we are talking about, CGRP is a protein which was practically paid attention to in early 1980s. It is a potent cerebral vasodilator. The antibody, which is like a designer drug, it works at different level of the function of CGRP. So the antibodies, which are all in phase two, phase three trials. None has been approved. It gives you examples of several of those that they are in the process of being to admitted to FDA for approval. Most likely they're going to be expensive because anything ends with MAP is one of those monoclonal antibodies. We have that for collagen vascular disease. We have that for multiple sclerosis. And we don't know what would be the potential side effect until we approach phase four. Phase four would be post-marketing. 
So patients read about these things, they ask you questions on can I have injection like every 28 days, can I have injection twice a week, can I have injection as I get the sick headaches. The answer would be this is not yet approved. Phase four, which is post-marketing, will tell us exactly what are the potential serious side effects for that and they are referred to as antibodies which would be is also a protein secreted by B cells, B lymphocyte, IgG, IgA, IgM, IgD, and there are more of that. And each one have a specific mechanism of action. So the action of this would be like tryptan. The only difference between this and Imtrax is these are a small molecule, they cross the blood-brain barrier and they work on the blood vessels which are cortical and in charge of vasoconstriction, vasodilatation. So they cause vasoconstriction but do not have as much periphery side effect like coronary artery vasoconstriction which can result in heart attack. So these are the new medications and I also brought something here which just was published recently. It says lower vitamin D level linked to increased frequency of headaches in men. They don't say why in men, why not in women. But I do not know. Have you heard vitamin D has become very popular? 20 or 30 years ago it was vitamin E. Everybody had to take vitamin E. They say it's even good for baldness. But we have so many bald people out there, so it didn't work. And then they later on learned that if you have too much vitamin E, it can cause heart attack. So vitamin D is not as pop E as popular. No, it's vitamin D. Linked to Alzheimer, Parkinson, multiple sclerosis for fact. Even there are studies shows children of MS, if they have low vitamin D level, they are more prone to develop MS. Now, in this article, it says men who have frequent headaches, if their vitamin D level is below 40, our computer system say 20 to 80 normal. The research says for MS, it should be 50 and above, 50, 60, 80, 90, 100. Toxic level is 150. I haven't seen anyone toxic with vitamin D. But men that they had low vitamin D, they had more headaches day per month of headaches. When they brought the level above 40, then the headaches reduced by more than 50%. They do not go through the mechanism of action. So if you have significant other that complains about headaches all the time, rather than popping ibuprofen or Tylenol, just simply ask them to take 2,000 or 5,000 or have a simple blood test. It's called vitamin D25 dehydroxylase. If the level is below 40, just put them on 2,000 or 5,000 urea vitamin D every day. This is just come to a closure before we go to question and answer. Trigem, we are talking about trigeminal temporal arthritis. Clinical diagnosis. If I have temporal arthritis, you touch that, I scream. If I have migraine, you press on it, it feels better. The old days that I went to school, no CAT scan, no MRI scan, no fancy test. We had to examine the patient, have diagnosis. But here, everybody with headache comes with one or two MRIs. So if the person comes older than 50, jaw claudication, they happen to have the headaches in the office, gently press on that, they scream. It's very tender. Itis, inflammation. But if it is migraine, you personally temporarily get better because there is vasodilatation. You try to cause vasoconstriction. Then muscle contraction headaches all around the head. When they do Botox, they inject all those muscles. Migraine without oral migraine with oral cluster headaches is very unique. So this is helpful when it comes to treating patients with headaches, but takes time and takes trust between physician and patient. If a man in China, 40 to 50, goes to doctor complain from chest pain, it is depression because the culture does not accept men to be depressed, especially in that age. This would be, no, but the other one is premier, but I'm going to explain that. 
premorbid personality. I have patients that they are on six or seven different medications for headaches. I take it morning, afternoon, and evening. I say, why do you do that? It's not healthy. She has three small kids. I said, the kids are always watching. Mom has headaches, and she's taking pills. Oh, he said, oh, no, my six-year-old daughter is on medication. Environmental factors, and there is one sad advertisement on TV, if you have watched that. The kids are playing in the front room, a six or seven years old girl comes and says, be quiet, mom has headaches, and suddenly a beautiful lady with the makeup and everything comes out, nice hairdo, not anymore, I took such and such medication. So it becomes learned behavior. That has a lot to do when you're trying to deal a patient with headaches and you really want to help them. Then secondary gain, when there is pending litigations or other circumstances, a simple fender bender accident, I have severe headaches. For some of you that you have not watched the movie Philadelphia, it's very educational. Tom Hanks, he got Oscar for that, even they got Oscar for the music, and it's, it's, it's about malpractice and litigations. So that will teach you a lesson. You cannot try. If you make the patients that there is a secondary gain down the line with headaches or neck pain or back pain, if you think you can cure them, you are going to expose yourself. Because if they get better, there is no case. This explains part of what I was talking about. Do you see the sergeant look unhappy? Do you think the officers will have post-traumatic headaches or muscle contraction headaches or I don't feel good or depression? They're proud. This was in demand register. If that little girl dropped one of those, she doesn't get paid for the whole day. Don't you think that child has headaches or neck pain or back pain? So we don't give credit to the brain how to deal with events and with circumstances. We just try to provide convenience, and it has become so-called pain medications. If you go and read, read about it, the way that Percocet and Percodon and Hydrocodon became popular in 80s and 90s, pharmaceutical company went to major medical societies, and they told them, your doctors are not treating the patient's pain adequately. There, were, there was a case in California. Patients, I believe, was in hospice, and the family sued the doctor. He did not properly, because that was the time that treating pain became very popular. There were conferences for pain education. Everybody had to attend how to learn to deal with chronic pain. Now we are being accused of prescribing too much pain medications because the heroin addiction. So there is a lots of money and lots of politics involved with the whole practice of medicine. And this child has no chance or choice or even possibilities to see a doctor when she comes home and she's tired when she's having headaches. She just put her head down and goes to sleep. Now, I have experienced that myself. You come to me, you have headaches, I give you, I haven't done it, but I have experience with my patients. Uh, I give you Tylenol, you're not better, I give you high dose. Naproxen, you're not better, I just give you Tramadol. You have headaches, oh, I believe your headaches is migraine with aura, and uh, I think that's the best way to approach it, that if you're not better, you come back to me. So everyone here or at university or the one that you're really practicing, you're good doctors, otherwise you wouldn't get there. But not every one of us happened to be a rare doctor. Example, one physician from India and from Iran married a beautiful young lady from America, blonde and blue eyes. Everything is rosy, they have a baby girl. Her mother comes to care for the family, stays for a week or 10 days. His parents come to help with the family. The father lives in three months and mom stays. So 
the nurse stopped having unpleasant headaches. Over-the-counter medication, going to neurologist, going to Mayo Clinic, coming to University Hospital, going to other places, and MRIs, spinal tap, blood tests. Nothing is working. So they came to me. And I made it clear I'm not a headache specialist. They said, we have heard that. But we also heard that you listen to the patient. I said, fine. I'm listening to the patient. So the doctor was there with his white coat. I'm with my white coat. And the lady was there, kind of quiet, restricted affect, and her head down. I said, fine. You tell me, when did your headaches start? So she gave me a date. Any idea why did your headaches start? She feels uncomfortable to talk. And I tell her, I can ask her husband to leave. I said, no. She said, my headaches started, for example, six months ago. Any idea, I keep trying to stay quiet, why did your headaches start? He said, my mom was there, she helped us, she left in about a week or 10 days. Her parents came, they stayed for three months, dad left, mom is here. No, the child is almost one and a half year old. The mom provides all the care, she has a good intention, she takes care of the family, she cooks, she cleans, she sleeps with the guests, she has the little girl in her room because they both are working, they are tired, she wants them to have a good night of sleep. And she feels that she's detached from her daughter, she is not raising her daughter. But she has this conflict to ask her husband that your mom has to leave. So I'm just listening. And she said, your grandma has been helping a lot. I said, you don't sound very happy about it. I said, but I don't see my daughter as often. Does it bother you? Of course it does. And then she started to cry. So I asked the husband, do you want to leave? And said, oh, so I had a page, I will come back. So we talked to her and she said, that, you know, it just bothers me. We have two bedroom apartment my husband and I, and then grandma is there, and she just shaved my daughter's head. She said, this is a tradition for some religious reason or other things. And I just can't take it anymore. So the husband came in, and I told her that, you know what? You might know that, but I don't want you to express it. I'm just simply telling you. I think your mother is the cause of her chronic daily headaches. And you have only two choices. You can ask your mom to leave, or you get a divorce. If you get a divorce, you stay in the back of the line to see your daughter once a week and pay child support as long as you work. I know that you know it's not a comfortable situation. And I told the young lady, when my parents come to visit, they have never been come thanks to the politics. Nobody can come from Iran to stay here for three months. So I said, when my parents, if they come, they don't leave. That's the tradition. That's the way it is. And grandma is doing her best. Anybody has anything to say? They're all quiet. <clears throat> so I said, fine. But I'm here if you have any question. Always call me. I told the lady, no more MRI, no more CAT scan, no more spinal tap, no more medication, nothing. And your husband is going to take care of it, and I'm going to page him in four weeks to see what has happened. Of course, I didn't page him. About three months or two months after, I got a thank you note. Grandma is gone. Things are better. We plan to go and visit the family in India in six months. Back to it takes time. There has to be some trust. And maybe gray hair and age, it also helps. Because if it comes from a 25 years old, just recently graduated medical student or doctor, he even doesn't have the courage to confront them like that. But my advice to a student resident has always been try to be a rare doctor, even occasionally. It's hard to do that all the time. Okay, so I believe
We have a few minutes for question and answer. If you don't ask question, I will ask question from you. Like how much do you make every year? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Hey, we have a question. Go ahead. Excellent talk. Thank you for that. Um, for rebound headache or overuse medications, my patients tell me I use Piptan every day. I have to use it. I have no other choice but to use it. How do you approach those patients? You mentioned hospitalization. What do you do during hospitalization? And you mentioned also it's effective for a few months and then you will go back to the previous pattern. Correct. Okay, it, we have two protocols. One is called DHE protocol, one is called tourism pr protocol. We take them all their medications and we give them around the clock. Anytime the complaints, the headache is getting worse. We either give them DHE or any kind of triptan or, uh, or tourism IV. And uh, it helps. Even the mechanism of medication or security of four walls or just seeing being there being taken seriously, they say I am better. I said, fine, then you come back and see me in three months. Most of them don't show up, so we call them. What happened? Oh, there was no reason because I'm back and taking that. And we have had professionals like nurses, doctors, bankers, that they went through the process and they start taking it. It's like addiction or it's just like environmental factors that you're living in. You cannot detach yourself from that place. And it's easy to access that. If you go to Hy-Vee or Walgreens, Walmart, look at the baskets, everybody comes out, 90% of them, they have some kind of over-the-counter pain medication in their basket. They just live with it. I just tell them, drink lots of water to protect your kidneys. But uh, if you can't help yourself, there is no way I can help you. Yes? Uh, why does uh, caffeine withdrawal uh, cause headaches or seem to cause headaches? Anything withdrawal to some degree, like hangover, for example, can cause headaches. Caffeine, a small amount, is protective to treat headaches. If, you're, if you have headaches yourself, you get attention to have headaches, or you get migraine, you want to get excited migraine, you simply take two excited with a cup of coffee is much more effective than taking the excedrin alone. On the other hand, we have patients, they have, they tell me, like mug this big, six or seven a day in 24 hours. And you suddenly, or because of any circumstances, you withdraw that, it's like a rebound. But there is no relationship between like a specific protein or amino acid to explain that. We, I have had patients, they had one gallon of Dr. Pepper every day. So it's hard to stop it. They have to bring them to the hospital again to the medication overuse headaches. But uh, caffeine withdrawal from excess up to one or two cups acceptable. Four cups and above, when you suddenly stop that, it can cause rebound or severe persistent headache. So I ask them to go to 50% coffee for a while if they can. Then just try to mix their coffee with hot water, make it as dilute as possible. second question. Please. So a, a number of years ago, I took care of a young man who was a paraplegic and uh, had, uh, every time he had an orgasm, uh, he had a bad headache. Correct. And, and the pathophysiology for that and, and the treatment for it? Uh, oh, for or is that, or it was Hippocrates that he mentioned that, that, that it can be. The mechanism of action for that is vasodilatation and uh, for some patients, we have tried triptan before they have sex. And if they assure them that it is not really life threatening, sometimes they get very scared or the partner get very scared. They can take a single dose of triptan or excedrin migraine and it's related to vasodilatation. Congestion in the eye, congestion in the blood vessels and Yes, a nice talk. Um, Thank you. I have uh, scotoma and scintillating lines uh, occasionally, but I never have pain that follows that. Is that not usual? No, it's called acephalgic aura. And if you want to read about that, 
I did that put on this slide, Google that. It's called late life migraine. Late life doesn't mean you have to be 80 or 90. Especially ladies, after age 50, as they approach menopause, the presentation of migraine changes. They will not have headaches as much, but they have paresthesia, they have weakness, they have confusion, they have dysarthria, and at least once a month, we see older patients, mostly women, but to some degree men, they have been diagnosed with partial seizure TIA, and they have late life migraine phenomenon. Everything which can happen with TIA or partial seizure can happen with that phenomenon without headaches. And if it happens too often, it's nice to be on prophylactic, or if I'm in your place, I just take one baby aspirin every day as a protect, uh, protection. Uh, I don't believe in waiting to have a heart attack and a stroke. If my patient has uh, any risk factor, I ask them to take. Uh, believe it or not, I was in medical, I was resident first year, maybe 25, 26. One of my professors in East Coast, he was the one that he introduced one aspirin a day can reduce or protect against heart attack and stroke. Ever since, I've been taking one 325 milligram of aspirin for 45 years. And uh, never had this, I don't, I don't say, you know, aspirin did that, maybe the guy up there did. Never missed a single day that I'm sick, I don't feel good, whatever. And I tell my patients that they have risk factor in their 40s and 50s, I say, take the aspirin. But they say, no, you shouldn't take it because you might bleed. I said, yeah, you shed yourself, you bleed. Do you want to have a heart attack or a stroke? Whatever. But I have been doing that. You, you can take one baby aspirin every day, and I believe it. The effect of total versus baby is the same, 81 milligram versus 325. But I have been taking that for 45 years every day. Anything else? Thank you.